Darius, you run a company with a staggering range and array of businesses. You've redefined this company around one word, sustainability. Why? Well, <clears throat> because the company always needs to stay contemporary to what the world needs. And it's very clear the world needs a number of technology solutions around sustainability. Um, and it just doesn't relate to energy. I mean, it goes much more beyond that, you know, whether it's human health and well-being and uh, human safety and so on. And, you know, across the array of our businesses, we think we have value to add uh, in sustainability in just about every segment that we play in, whether it's aerospace or energy or automation. Um, you know, we have solutions in all those segments. Now, by your accounting, <coughs> Sustainability, these sustainability-related businesses, mm -hmm. some of which you've just described, account for 60% of your revenue? That's correct. Uh, greater than 60% of our revenues is associated with ESG-oriented things, which, you know, which really isn't that big of a surprise if you think about you know, who Honeywell is. I mean, Honeywell, in essence, there's one common thread throughout our businesses which is controls and automation. I mean, that is the common thread throughout our businesses. And what do controls and automation do? Well, they, first of all, they keep things within limits, within operating norms. But the second and very important thing that they do, in many instances, but not all, is optimize around energy usage. And saving energy is probably the number one sustainability goal that all of us have. ESG is a three-letter term but in some circles it's becoming a four-letter word. Politicians in the United States are questioning the motives behind ESG, and some investors are losing faith. One big reason for that is credibility. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to know what's right. real <clears throat> and what's bunk. Right. So in your view, tell us, if you would, what about the sustainability movement do you believe in, and what would you say amounts to greenwashing? Well, I believe in all of it, so let's start with that. But, but you're right. I mean, there has to be a credibility. It's very easy to say something. It's a little bit harder to do it and to prove it. So, you know, let, let's, and I'll just provide a couple of examples mm -hmm. from Honeywell because I think it's relevant. So before ESG was a bit of, you know, kind of a buzz, I mean, way before that happened. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that Honeywell has been doing for about a decade and a half is reducing our carbon emissions. So if we go back all the way to 2005, 2004, we've actually reduced our carbon emissions by 90%. 90%. So, so this is not something new that it's now interesting and everybody's talking about it. We've been doing this for a decade and a half. On top of that, you know, we've made a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2035. But that, that's also, I don't think, sufficient because that's far enough that I can't be held accountable for it. You might not be right. I mean, I mean, it. that's right. It's, you know, so sort of making commitments that are 2050 and out are pretty easy to make because most people are not going to be in their current jobs that they're in. But we also made a commitment that we're going to reduce carbon emissions by a further 10 percent within three years. Mm. So we have. So I think in our case, we have an established track record and doing it for a decade and a half. We've got a fairly short-term goal, another 10% reduction of N3, and then we're going to get to where we want, we need to get to by 2035. And I think that that's kind of how you improve credibility rather than just making long-term promises and saying we'll get there someday. You've positioned Honeywell to play a leading role in the energy transition. Mm -hmm. What happens to the speed and maybe the scope of that transition if the war in Ukraine keeps raging? Well, we all want to get to, uh, to, to, to sources of sustainable energy tomorrow. I mean, I think if we could all uh, wave, Flip or, a switch. Yeah, <laughs> wave, wave a magic wave wand, a magic wand, one of those kinds of things that we'd all love to be there tomorrow. But the reality is we can't be there tomorrow. And the reality is the world is energy short. Um, there's been some um, events that occurred. There's a uh, Ukraine-Russia war that frankly exacerbated the problem. Um, you know, whether we look at North America, or whether we look at Western Europe, we are clearly energy short. And in the short term, 
Uh, we need hydrocarbons. We frankly need hydrocarbons to fill that energy gap so that we don't cause economic um, uh, hardship. Now, medium to long term, we, we do have to start making that transition to sustainable sources of energy. And the way Honeywell thinks about this is, you know, we kind of play on both ends of the spectrum. Number one is we certainly want to continue to help our current customers who are in the oil and gas sector in their what we call classic areas mm -hmm. and help them get more carbons out of the ground and transmit them and, and process them. And that's certainly part of our business. But another big part of our business is also sustainability technology solutions because Honeywell has just about every relevant technology that's going to be important for the future. So whether it's you know, green fuels, whether it's plastics recycling, whether it's hydrogen-oriented technologies, carbon capture, battery storage, these are all technologies that are either well-developed and we have today or we're fairly advanced in the development. So, you know, we want to we want to play on both sides of the spectrum and really lead that transition effort. Nukes are back on the table, especially in Europe. Honeywell owns the only domestic uranium UF6 conversion facility in the United States. Now that this nuclear fuel supply chain is in question because so much of that comes out of Russia, would you consider making a bigger bet on the nuclear industry? Well, I think that's to be determined because, you know, frankly, there was a lot of capacity in that conversion. You know, now we're left with the only facility that's there in the U.S. So, I mean, I think we have to take a look at what the economics are, mm -hmm. what level of commitment there is to nuclear energy. I mean, you know, we all know that nuclear energy has some pluses in terms of, but it also has some minuses. And, and you know, I think we have to see really where things evolve. And it's at this point, it's too early to Too talk. early. Darius, everyone is waiting for the economic shoe to drop. Do you feel like there's a recession coming? Well, I mean, if I had to sort of give you my best somewhat educated guess, I would say that it's likely. Well, that. you must have some visibility into the yeah, future, we, right? You have an order I, book. It's been very positive. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say our order book is very positive. And, and you know, we, we have two sets of businesses. Uh, that was being long cycle, which is energy and aerospace. And I would say that those continue to do extraordinarily well and you know, we have record backlogs and, and that it continues to be a very robust market. And we have some short cycle uh, businesses which are also doing relatively well and the orders rate are growing, but we are starting to see some level of, I would say, um, flattening of some of the growth. Not, not in any dramatic way, uh, and, then, and not in a way which would cause me to take actions in terms of costs and things of that nature, because I think the markets overall are very positive. But, you know, when I look at the set of facts out there, you know, which is the Fed's tightening probably quicker than most people anticipated, we've got a lot of the... <clears throat> Stimulus that's been mm -hmm. fed into the economy is kind of wearing off. You know, we have supply chain challenges, we have inflation, and that's a lot of things to navigate to try to avoid our recession. Now, I'm not a pessimist because I think if we do have our recession, I think it would be a relatively mild one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and frankly, as I look at the makeup of Honeywell, I think we're going to weather it better than most just because of the makeup of our portfolio. I mean, in 2020, when COVID hit, a couple of the sectors that were hit the hardest were aerospace and energy. Well, even through a potential recessionary environment, uh, I don't think the world's going to stop investing in energy. And it's probably, there's a lot of pent-up demand for flying, and aviation has come back much faster than probably most of us would have anticipated. And that's primarily due to consumer travel, not business travel. And Myself and I think many people like myself are getting out of here and traveling a lot more. And I think there's still tremendous pent-up demand to do more of that. As we established, ESG-related products and services account for more than 60% of Honeywell's revenue. That has to create a halo around the Honeywell brand and maybe an uplift for your equity multiple. Would you ever consider turning Honeywell into a sustainability pure play and either divesting or spinning off that other 40%? You 
You know, we, we always revisit our portfolio. I mean, that, you know, portfolio um, analysis is, is, I would say, part of our DNA. We do that on a, at least twice a year basis, both additions and subtractions. But I would say just to do it just because of that I, is, is a little bit different. And, and let's be honest, you know, I think what, even what ESG is and what it isn't is, I think, being re-examined. You know, we do some work in defense. It's, you know, I think four months ago was that it was viewed negatively. Now, might have a little bit of a different view. Energy uh, might be viewed a little bit differently. You know, you, even, you know, UF6, you, you mentioned that in your prior question. Even that has a little bit of a... So as, you, so as you look at this, you know, I think you can chase things that might have a certain prism one day and might have a little bit of a different prism tomorrow. So. You know, we look at the portfolio, and ESG certainly is a filter we, we look through it, but there are many others that we look at as well. Darius, it's been such a pleasure talking to you here at the Qatar Economic Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you.